For my talk, I want to speak about Machen, just a little bit about his life. We've heard a wonderful presentation of the highlights of Machen's life from Dr. Tweedale. I want to hone in on those years of 1917 to 1923. So we'll talk about Machen. Secondly, we'll talk about his book. We have various presentations today, different elements from his book. I have a few things I want to bring forth about his book. And then thirdly, I want to pick up our conference theme, 100 years later, and the implications, the, the application of Machen to what we have today. Machen was 42 years old when he published Christianity and Liberalism. I think in many ways it represents what is at the heart of Machen's calling and purpose. But the recognition of that calling and purpose was a long time coming. As you heard of Machen's early years, he was a little unsure of what he wanted to do. Uh, his biographer, Daryl Hart, points out that Machen's father was long on resources and long on patience, and that might have contributed to Machen taking quite a few years to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. Uh, we find Machen in 1907 having studied at Johns Hopkins University, a master's in philosophy from Princeton University, a master's from Princeton Theological Seminary, and study in Germany. And he reluctantly accepts a position at Princeton Theological Seminary as an instructor. As he is seeking advice from his dad, unsure if he should take this position, his father, Arthur Machen, says to him, You've had training, which will serve a good purpose, whatever field of life's work may be assigned to you. And then he adds, you are abundantly young enough for any fresh start. Uh, Machen is starting a career as a professor, unsure if he even wants to do this. Uh, so much so that his dad says, you have nothing to lose. Go ahead and do it. And if you don't like it, we'll figure something out. And in many ways, from 07 to 1917, Machen, I believe, still has not found his purpose. Now, by 1917, he's found his place. His place is Princeton. He went there reluctantly as a student. He went there maybe ambivalently as a professor. But very early on, he embraced Princeton 39 Alexander Hall as his home. That tree-lined campus of Princeton Theological Seminary was his home. Which is why his departure in 1929, I believe, was so painful for Mage. While he had found his place by 1917, I still don't think he has found his purpose. Uh, Machen is long beyond the need to go serve in the war. And so why would Machen uh, leave Princeton and go and serve in World War I? I, I think he still hasn't quite found what his life's purpose is yet. But now three things are going to happen between 1917 and 1922. First is World War I. As already discussed, Machen serves with the YMCA, spends most of his time making hot chocolate. You know how you made hot chocolate in France in 1918? You had to get wood. You had to light a fire. You had to put a kettle over the fire. You had to fill it with water, wait for it to boil, dump in big blocks of chocolate, and stir. It was rather labor intensive. Uh, Machen said his uniform was bespotted with chocolate. It wasn't all fun and games. It's having a conversation with someone in a doorway, turns and goes inside, a bomb explodes and takes that person's life. It was did not see action on the front, never lifted a weapon. 
but he saw plenty of the destruction and devastation to life and landscape. And he comes back, uh, I believe, with a renewed purpose. In fact, early on in his time in the war, he says, if I survive, if God, if God permits that, that I get home, I'll have a renewed conviction of being a preacher of the gospel. The war, as you can imagine, brought a sense of urgency and calling to Machen that I don't think he had before. That's one. Number two is Warfield. By now, Warfield's an old man. There's a warm relationship between Machen and Warfield. At times, it had its complications. But it was a warm relationship. And Machen, when, when Warfield dies and Machen writes to his mother, he recalls one of their last conversations and they're walking along. And, and I can picture this in my mind. And Machen has prepared himself to, you know, make that comment that will likely impress Warfield. And I could see him thinking it through and how he's going to word it and just get it exactly right. And so he says to Warfield, speaking of the condition of the church at the time, that it does appear that there will be a split in the church. And it drops. And Machen waits for Warfield to say, that was so profound, young Machen. And instead, Warfield looks at him and says, you can't split dead wood. And what was Warfield saying? Eh, the die has been cast. It's just a matter of time. The soul of the church has left the building. Machen famously says as they carry Warfield's body out of Miller Chapel, formerly named Miller Chapel, they're taking, carrying old Princeton with him. Uh, Warfield was a defender of the faith from the time he was at Western Theological Seminary. Now, where is Western Theological Seminary in these United States? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> because at one time, Pittsburgh was the Western frontier. Before he got to Princeton, it was at Western Theological Seminary with Hodge, not Charles, AA, published the bombshell essay on inerrancy. And from then on, what was Warfield? He was the lion of old Princeton, the defender of the faith. And who would replace Warfield at his death? And so with Warfield's passing, who would it be who would now stand between Migdal and the sea? And it was Machen. And then there's one more thing. There's a battle. And the battle was raging in the seminaries. It goes back to Briggs and the famous Briggs case of 1880. It was in Germany long before it came to America, dominating much of the second half of the 20th century. You remember those famous words of the fiery evangelist Billy Sunday, turn hell upside down and what's stamped on the bottom? Made in Germany. A little nationalism coming out, but what's really coming out there is German higher criticism. A muck in the universities and seminaries of Europe, which then trickles down to the pulpit, which then trickles down to the pew for decades. Now it has been imported to these United States. And the same thing's going to happen. It's going to start in the seminaries and it's going to start with an academic book on the authorship of the Pentateuch. And then it's going to be churned out over years and decades of training ministers of the gospel who are challenging that the very subject of their preaching are the divine oracles. 
And then they turn and give their congregations stones instead of the bread of life. All this reaches ahead in the liberalism, modernism, fundamentalism controversy in 1922 when Harry Emerson Fosdick preaches his sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And Fosdick had a backer, Rockefeller. And so that sermon gets printed and distributed to every single YMCA officer across the United States. It gets printed on the front page of newspapers across the United States. Shall the fundamentalists win? We have World War I. We have the passing of the mantle from Warfield. And we have the reason for a battle. And Machen has found his purpose. 1922, 23 is a very busy time for Machen. He's got a full load at Princeton. He is in constant demand as a speaker. Uh, in January, February, and March, and on into April, Machen of 23, Machen is going to spend 16 weeks, one night a week, taking the train from Princeton to Trenton, New Jersey, and teaching a class at the YMCA of Trenton, New Jersey. He's speaking to ministerial groups, and he's publishing the New Testament Greek grammar for beginners. There's a file this thick of correspondence between Machen and his publisher over that book of how many times Macmillan Press got the accent marks wrong on words that Machen had to correct. It isn't just a simple thing to publish a Greek grammar. This is labor intensive. And if you'd like to see Dr. Sproul's copy of Machen's Greek grammar, it's over there in one of our glass cases. And on top of all that, he publishes Christianity and liberalism. 19. 23. When Fosdick preached his sermon, the first salvo shot from the other side was by Machen's colleague, Clarence McCartney. And his sermon was entitled, Shall Unbelief Win? We call that taking the fight to the dog. <laughs> Machen's response is his book. So we have Machen, now we have his book. Uh, behind this book is the modernism, liberalism, fundamentalism controversy. Let's see that we get all of this right. Uh, modernism is what's happening in culture. If you study this era of uh, American history, we call it the progressive era. That's modernism. The key word is progress. As we enter into the 20th century, there was nothing but optimism for the future of humanity. This was the century where we would come into our own. Incredible advancements were taking place in the fields of engineering and building. We're building skyscrapers, like the Empire State Building. In the fields of medicine, uh, in the fields of transportation, in the fields of industry. And all of this is contributing to a spirit of progress. And if there is one thing about progress, it is this. It is an unfettered belief in the next step. The next step will be good, will be positive. And the only thing that will hold us back is looking back. It is time to put former sensibilities in the rearview mirror and forge ahead. That's the progressive era. That's modernism. And key to modernism, and we're going to see this very quickly, key to modernism is a belief in human achievement. And these ideas that we are sinful or of total depravity or of human inability are relics of the past. 
that we must slough off like so much dead skin so that we can move forward. That's modernism. And if it means leave God and the Bible and Jesus and all of those fun stories that were great, neat, when we were kids in Sunday school, so be it. Because moderns know that you don't survive in the belly of a great fish and virgins don't give birth and the dead do not rise again. Moderns know this. And so it's time to leave all that behind. That's modernism. We've outgrown God. We've outgrown our need for him. The church, which has enjoyed a seat at the table in American culture for centuries now, will stand in the door and say, wait a minute, don't leave just yet. Tell us what you have problems with. And we can accommodate to meet your needs. That is liberalism. Liberalism does not want to see culture pass it by. And it will even say this under the noble goal of we must keep a foot in the door so that we can remain salt and light in culture. We have a nobler goal here, the ends uh, justify the means. We don't want to be left behind. We don't want a churchless United States. We don't want a soulless America. And while we're at it, let's remember that this fundamentalist modernist controversy is a transatlantic phenomenon. What is happening in the United States is happening in the church in the United Kingdom. So that's liberalism. In fact, here's a line from Fosdick's sermon. Shall the fundamentalists win? We must think Christianity clear through in modern terms. We must think Christianity clear through in modern terms. Now, whenever you hear someone say, it is time for Christians to rethink something. You need to put on your running shoes and go in the entire opposite direction. We can say reaffirm. Uh, we can say renew our understanding thereof. But the moment we start saying rethink, we are accommodating our convictions and our faith to the predilections and sensibilities of the age. In fact, it's going to be as a culmination of all this stuff in 1933, the massive work study of six denominations across many nations in Asia is going to be published rethinking missions. And it's no longer time to proclaim the gospel and teach the faith. Missions needs to transform itself and be about education and welfare. But here we are back with Fostick. What are the Christian terms? We're talking about clear through. Here's what we're talking about. The Bible, Christ, the, the presence of miracles in the Bible, the work of Christ on the cross, and the nature of Christ's second coming. Uh, these are the things, not not the periphery of, of Christian doctrine, not those things that, that can sometimes uh, be points of disagreement for us within the center of historic Christian faith, but no, uh, the very heart of the thing itself. So that's liberalism. So we've got modernism and its belief in progress, jettisoning everything of historic Christian faith. We've got liberalism, which says, before you go out the door, give us a chance. We might be able to accommodate you. And then we have fundamentalism. Now, Machen reluctantly took the term fundamentalist. Uh, for one, fundamentalists were an interesting bunch, aren't they? They include the, the fighting Southern Baptists. In fact, it's a Baptist who's going to use the coin, uh, coin the term fundamentalist. 
And a fundamentalist is anyone who believes in the fundamentals of the faith and is willing to do battle royale for them. Spoken like a true Baptist. It's going to include the dispensationalists of the Schofield Study Bible type. Machen was not entirely aligned with these folks. It's going to include those who want to uh, separate out from culture. And so they will be able to say, as the old saying has it, I don't dance and I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with girls who do. Come on, you can laugh at that one. None of this is where Machen resides. So where does Machen reside? The historic Christian faith. Confessionalism. And so if the choice is between a liberal and a fundamentalist, it's clear. Call me a fundamentalist. Machen would just simply prefer that you call him a Presbyterian. But he would even more so appreciate that what we're talking about here is the historic Christian faith. So you have modernism. It's the specter. You have liberalism, which is the accommodating response. And you've got fundamentalism or the historic Christian faith. So let's see how this plays out. We can see how this plays out in terms of doctrine in Machen's book. Just the approach to doctrine in general. And on liberalism, belief is not to be preferred. It's behavior. It's not so much doctrine. It's lifestyle. It's sermon on the mount over everything else. It's following Jesus' example of being selfless and kind and neighborly and loving and compassionate. And while we're on the subject, it's certainly not Paul. It's Jesus, not Paul. Paul's um, Roman in his thinking, philosophical in his thinking. He's, he's systematizing all of these uh, teachings by example of Jesus. Uh, little wonder that Machen's first big book, he had published some books that were Sunday school materials he wrote that became a survey of Old and New Testaments. But his first big book, 1921, was The Origin of Paul's Religion. And, and what's his response? Where does Paul's religion come from? Jesus. Where does Paul's religion come from? The Gospels. There's nothing new in Paul. Uh, this, this message, this, what the early church called the Depositum Fide, has been entrusted from Jesus to the disciples and then to the teachers who then codify this and, and scripturate this for us in the 27 books of the canon of the New Testament. And then this becomes, as Machen says what doctrine is, the message of Jesus Christ that the church proclaims. Uh, doctrine is nothing more and nothing less than the message of Jesus Christ. And there is no Christianity without it. Now, while the liberals are saying that Christianity is a lifestyle and not a doctrine, Machen says, no, it is a lifestyle, but it's a doctrine first. And the lifestyle comes from the doctrine. And doctrine is at the heart of being a Christian. The second difference between liberalism and the historic Christian faith or Christianity as Machen just calls it in his book, is not only this idea of belief leading to a lifestyle versus only a lifestyle, is an indifference, an ambivalence towards doctrine. It's seen as unnecessary for the church and for the Christian. So after his introduction, his first chapter in the book is on doctrine. It is not something we can be indifferent to or ambivalent towards. It is at the very heart of being a Christian.
And then he moves into particular doctrines, puts God and man together, just like the beginnings of Calvin's Institutes, puts God and man together. And then he moves on to the Bible. And then he moves on to Christ and he moves on to salvation. And then being a good churchman, he ends with the church. So let's just drop in on God and man and see what Machen has to say. And some, for the historic Christian faith, the doctrine of God is about the great gulf between God and man. Machen says it this way, liberalism has lost sight of the very center and core of the Christian teaching. In the Christian view of God as set forth in the Bible, there are many elements. But one attribute of God is absolutely fundamental in the Bible. One attribute is absolutely necessary in order to render intelligible all the rest. That attribute is the awful transcendence of God. Now, I know you all wanted Machen to use the word holiness. I know that's what you were waiting for. But let's think this through. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. When Dr. Sproul was talking about the holiness of God, he was not talking about holiness as an attribute per se. He was talking about holiness as defining the very essence of who God is. And that's what Machen is saying with his expression, awful transcendence of God. Now, let's rethink the word awful. Full of awe. That's the word. Awful. Not horrible and bad and ugly and no good for us. Awful. And not awesome. As in everything is awesome. And if everything is awesome, then nothing is awesome. But there is one thing that is awesome. And it's the being with the most being. It is the most perfect being. And we have this word transcendence, don't we? See, for the liberal, the word is imminence. It, it's, the, it's the God who, who is my buddy. It's the God who is grandfatherly. It is the God who is sort of like the gods of the Greek myths. Not entirely different from us. That transcendence, now there is a distinction of being between God and man. God is a necessary being and we are contingent beings. We need other beings to exist. God exists in himself. That attribute, Machen says, is the awful transcendence of God. From beginning to end, the Bible is concerned to set forth the awful gulf that separates the creature from the creator. Not so in liberalism. There's no gulf. Uh, the, the buzzword of liberalism was the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Fatherhood of God is more than just God as creator. It's universalism is what it is. And we're all in. And God is all for us. And that's where liberalism starts. And if that's the first domino to fall, then you can guarantee that every single domino that continues to fall is falling in the wrong place. And that leads us to the next domino, which is man. And so what is the historic Christian faith view of man? A consciousness of human sin, Machen says. If we have an awareness of the transcendence of God, woe is me. A consciousness of human sin but not so in liberalism. 
According to modern liberalism, Machen continues, there is really no such thing as sin. At the very root of the modern liberal movement is the loss of the consciousness of sin. The consciousness of sin was formerly the starting point of all preaching, but today it's gone. Characteristic of the modern age, above all else, is a supreme confidence in human goodness. The religious literature of the day is redolent of that confidence. Get beneath the rough exterior of men, we are told, and we shall discover enough self-sacrifice to found upon it the hope of society. The world's evil, it is said, can be overthrown with the world's good. No help is needed from the outside. Do you remember the two little words that sort of sealed it for Luther? Extra nose. Uh, when Luther realized the sinfulness of his self, but not only the sinfulness of his self, the inability of himself to do anything about it. And all of his contemporaries had this notion of human goodness. All of his contemporaries had this notion of human ability. They could white knuckle their way back into the presence of God. And when Luther realized he couldn't, it was such a weight that dropped on his shoulders that all he can say is, I hate this righteous God. Until hope could be found. Extra nose. Outside of him. Someone else can do what he cannot do. But for liberalism, there's no need. There's no need for a cross. Oh, sure, Jesus died on it. But he died on it to show us how, how to be selfless. He died on it to show good people a path to be even better. So we have liberalism. When you take a step back from this, and it, it's very easy to just be critical. It's very easy to do a lot of uh, high five and, and back patting that we, we reformed. We always cross our T's in the right place and dot our I's in the right place. And everyone else is always getting it wrong. Uh, that's one response. Can we take a step back? and see what's at stake here. This is leaving people without any hope of redemption. If we don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are, we have no gospel to preach. And if we have no gospel to preach, we're all hopeless. That's what's going on here. You know, Machen has this beautiful line, two pages after these quotes I just read from you. Christianity is a religion of the broken hearted. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Just to show you how relevant Machen is to our day, that is a very tweetable quote. In fact, I'd say it would probably get more likes than anything any of us are going to say today when we put that out. And it should. Christianity is a religion for the brokenhearted. That's what's going on here. Uh, not, not simply, hey, we got it right. But now we understand the gospel. And now we can say, the death of Christ is my only hope. The God-man 
is my only hope. We don't need to rethink anything clear through in modern terms. Do you know what modern man needs to know that Christianity is the religion of the brokenhearted? Just so we understand what's going on here, here's, I don't know how else to categorize this. Here's some of the nonsense that, that Fosdick said in his sermon. Uh, one of those things that he wants to rethink is the virgin birth. Uh, Fosdick says the virgin birth is to be, this is one way, one way to understand it. The virgin birth is to be accepted as historical fact. It actually happened. There was no other way for a personality like the master to come into this world except by a special biological miracle. A virgin birth, an historical event, took place time and space. It actually happened as the Bible recorded. That's, that's one way to understand it. Another way, he explains, is this, to believe in the virgin birth as an explanation of great personality is one of the familiar ways in which the ancient world was accustomed to account for unusual superiority. According to the records of their faith, Buddha and Zoroaster and the Mahavira were all supernaturally born, as were Plato and Augustus Caesar. The disciples thought so highly of Christ's special nature that they framed it as the virgin birth. They phrased it in terms of a biological miracle. And then he says this, that our modern minds cannot use. So, so one way to understand the virgin birth is that it happened. Happened as the Bible says it. Another way to understand it is this is the product of a poor, unscientific, mythological, age-bound mind to express their devotion to their religious leader. And if we carry it forward as if it happened, well, the modern mind can't use this. Uh, how does this not break our hearts? How does this thinking not break our hearts? Uh, some of you may very well be exposed and have been exposed and come out of contexts of the, the grandchildren of liberalism of the 1920s and come from what we broadly call mainline Protestantism and know that it is hollow, not unlike as Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, whitewashed sepulchers. And if we don't have who God is and who we are and who Christ is and what salvation is and what the Bible is, again, all people are being fed is stones instead of bread. And all preaching is reduced to helping good people, such good people, become even better people. Well, Machen wrote his book, to say, certainly you can believe what you want to believe. Machen was a libertarian. He loved that America was a free country. No compulsion here. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but you can't believe whatever you want to believe and call it Christianity. Because Christianity is actually a thing. It has boundaries. It's been around for millennia. Historic Christian faith. And, it, and Christianity defines God 
and man and the Bible and Christ and salvation in the church in such a way. And so you can believe whatever you want to believe on those topics. But if you redefine all of those topics so they are devoid of their meaning from historic Christian faith, that's not Christianity. That's what Machen was saying in his book. That's liberalism. Well, let's ask the question, where are we a hundred years later? It's 2023. I honestly think Machen's book is more relevant today than when he published it. I hardly believe that. I'm glad that there's a little bit of a Machen renaissance going on out there with this year. Has culture continued to influence the church? In the 1910s and 20s, it was the hard sciences that came head on at the Bible. Here's the Bible's view of origins. Here's evolution. Are you going to be modern? Put your, or are you going to put your head in the sand? What do we have today? The hard sciences continue to hammer at the Bible. But we've added to the mix the social sciences, haven't we? Take anything in Genesis 1 to 3, it's fair game. Gender identity is fair game. There's nothing about it that is not a social construct. Gender. Sexual identity is a social construct. You are free to choose who you will be and who you will love. We have unleashed our brutish human nature, haven't we? Brutal means of or relating to the lower animals. I think it's a good word to describe much of culture. Brutal. It's ricocheting. It's as if we've given up our identity as creatures in the image of God. We've, we've adopted brutality over dignity. Uh, what do we have today but a fight, a battle? Culture has influenced the church. We all know it. Anecdotally, our spidey sense intuitively feels it. Let me give you some statistical data from our State of Theology survey. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And before we get to the results, let's think about what's at stake here. This is pluralism. This is understanding who God is and what he accepts as worship, understanding who I am and what I can do, and the gospel. Everything's at stake in this answer. Uh, missions is at stake in this answer. Evangelism is at stake in this answer. Preaching of the gospel, the existence of the church is at stake in this answer. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. When put to the United States general population, 67% agree. Two-thirds. When put to evangelicals, 58% agree. Over half of those self-identifying as evangelicals are pluralists. Now, here's even more alarming. When put to evangelicals between the ages of 18 and 34, the number spikes to 64%. Culture has influenced the church. And the church is accommodating to cultural sensibilities in our day, just as it did in Machen's day. Here's another one. Even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. This reminds me of Dr. Dr. Sproul's quote, sin is cosmic treason. Even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. Again, what's at stake here? Our understanding of God, our understanding of who we are, our understanding of extra nos, the, the need if we are damned. Put to a U.S. population, 25% agree. Actually, I was impressed by that number. 
I thought, much, much more of the U.S. population. But only one in four agree with that statement. But here is something tragic. When put to evangelicals, 40%. Evangelicals are worse on this question by far, statistically, than their non-evangelical counterparts. Let that sink in. Now I'm going to say something very provocative here. Machen's book is very relative to life 100 years later. But what if we retitled it to Christianity and Evangelicalism? So what are we talking about here? We're not talking about, oh, we've got it right. And uh, most people out there have it wrong. Let's not do that. This isn't time for self-congratulation that we get this survey right. This is a time to recognize our role in helping people in the church see that we cannot be indifferent to doctrine. Uh, this is a time for us to help people in the church to see that we cannot simply reduce Christianity to behavior. And so my uh, Muslim neighbor might be far more devout than I. God certainly will honor that. Uh, this is a time for us to help those in the church, fellow disciples, together remember who God is and who we are and our need for a substitute in Jesus Christ. And then, this is where we need a little steel in our backbone. The temptation is always there to accommodate to culture. I like to phrase this as we want to sit at the cool table. It goes back to my junior high years. Do you remember the cool table in junior high? Dr. Tweedale sat at the cool table in junior high. I was, I was off in the hinterlands wishing I could be at the cool table. In one sense, if we go back, American evangelicals had a seat at the cool table. We got people elected into the White House. We have celebrities who convert. We have football heroes kneeling to pray. We're cool. And in an increasingly antagonistic culture, we're no longer cool. And now comes the noble goal of remaining salt and light. What do we need to do to keep our voice? Let me have Machen give us the final word. This takes us to the end of the book. My pages have fallen out of my book. I use it so much. Makes it convenient, though, to get quotes. What the immediate future may bring, we cannot presume to say. How many of you think that about this moment that we experience? What the immediate future may bring, we cannot presume to say. But the final result is clear. God has not deserted his church. He has brought her through even darker hours than those which try our courage now. We have today the entrance of paganism into the church, into the nature of Christianity. But in the second century, a similar battle was fought and won. won. From another point of view, modern liberalism is like the legalism of the Middle Ages and its dependence upon the merit of man. And another reformation in God's good time will come. Sounds great, doesn't it? But then Machen says this. But meanwhile, our souls are tried. Do you feel it? 
Do you feel the weight of it? Do you feel the challenge of it? That's what Machen's saying. We know God is faithful. We know God is faithful. We know the church has been here before. But far more importantly, God was there before the beginning of time. We know that. But meanwhile, our souls are heavy. We can only try to do our duty in humility and in sole reliance upon the Savior who bought us with his blood. That's what we do. We, we tend the garden that's in front of us as humble servants of God, knowing that we are in Christ as we do it. Father God, we thank you for Machen. We thank you for his book. We pray that we would have this courage, even in light of the challenges of our day, to be faithful, to indeed trust in you, and to do our duty as your humble servants, depending upon the strength and mercy and grace of our Savior. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.